Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to this episode of the Referology series. Uh, and we are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Mok Xiaofeng, who has kindly agreed to let us interview him about hyponatremia. Today, I have uh, Shi Yan, who will be uh, fielding the questions together with me. Um, so maybe we can just uh, start with a quick overview for today's session. Um, so I've sort of broken down into four main areas. The first is um, about the management of patients with severe hyponatremia. Uh, then we'll have a look at the etiological evaluation uh, with a focus on looking at uh, evaluating osmolality, understanding and interpreting urinary studies, and what to do in special uh, situations with patients with comorbidities. The third space is about monitoring and troubleshooting. And finally, um, we'll have a quick discussion about treatment in SIADH. Um, so maybe we can talk a bit about uh, hy severe hyponatremia. So Dr. Mock, um, what are the indications uh, for patients uh, for us to give normal, uh, sorry, hypertonic 3% saline in patients with hyponatremia? Okay, um, so I think here we need to understand what um, severe hyponatremia means. Mm. So you can look at it both from the point of view of the figure, the number, as well as symptoms. So uh, you can have patients with very severe hyponatremia represented by sodium less than say 120, 125, but yep. they can be fairly asymptomatic. In those instances, the patient probably has a hyponatremia for a very long time. Okay. So they, they would have had time to, uh, had for the brain to adapt and therefore the osmolality within the cell is fairly uh, in equilibrium in the uh, ECF. So therefore they don't have problems with cerebral edema. So ultimately, when we give hypertonic saline, it is in patients who are, um, who are likely experiencing cerebral edema as a result of hyponatremia okay. due to free water shift into the brain. So um, I think this is where you need to go by symptoms. Yep. So patients who demonstrate symptoms of altered mental status, uh, such as confusion, delirium, stupor, or even coma states or uh, seizure, so those are the ones when you see that this in addition to uh, sodium level that's very low, um, let's say less than 120. I, I think this is when you have an indication to give hypertonic saline carefully to try and reduce the cerebral edema in the brain. Um, I think the caveat here is that um, when you approach the symptomology of acute delirium, you always have to exclude many other things. Yep. Whether you are dealing with a patient with a uh, um, space occupation on or organic or something in the brain, or whether it's a metabolic cause, something like hypoglycemia. So, it, I would say that you need to take the general approach to acute delirium to make sure you are not missing out anything uh, within a finite a period of time. And when you're fairly certain that this altered mental status is indeed due to hyponatremia, uh, and the sodium should be low enough, uh, so you shouldn't have symptoms with your sodium of say one thirty. Yep. Because that kind of value just does not cause severe hyponatremia, or rather that kind of, it just doesn't cause the symptoms that will give rise to alter mental status or CNS. So you need some judgment there. Understand. So okay. though that would be an instance when I would say you can give hyper, uh, hypertonic saline when the sodium is low enough and when the symptoms are suggestive of uh, CNS compromising cerebral edema. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, then Dr. Mo, how, how should we then give this hypertonic saline? Okay, so I think importantly, we need to understand that um, the, give, the provision of hypertonic saline is something that must be done carefully. Yeah. Um, and so you, first and foremost, when you want to give, somebody should always escalate. Okay, so ideally, if you have an endocrine consultant on service, you should escalate to the endocrine consultant on service. In the middle of the night, I think at least the senior resident need to be aware. Okay. So when we give, the aim really is to bring the sodium up by about 4 to 5 millimolar with the intention of alleviating the cerebral edema. That is the intention. Okay. So to, to, to achieve that, um, and I would say you, uh, there's, uh, what, what is described is based on expert opinion. So there's no RCT to guide this. Understand. So um, if you refer to the EJE reference that I provided in 2014, the guidelines of hyaluronic treatment, that is one of the better guides that you can look to as a reference. Okay. So just off the cuff, in terms of how we correct, um, you, uh, if you use the weight-based calculation, you can give about 2 mL per kg up to a maximum of 150 mL of hypertonic saline for single bolus. Okay. okay? And then you will give that uh, over... Okay, so over, it could be over 30 minutes or over an hour. The period, how fast you give it is very variable. It's once again expert opinion. Okay. So you give the single bolus and then you observe the patient's symptoms 
for about 30 minutes and the symptoms may be slow to recover. So in about after that first bolus and having rechecked the sodium, if let's say you see that the sodium rise is only one or two, yep. then you give a second bolus, you calculate it in the same fashion. So, so how you, quickly do you check the sodium after that? Because you mentioned okay. right, it's one or two. Mm. Yeah, so I would say that you, you, you give it, and, and let's say you give it over, say, an hour. Yep. I would say usually within half an hour to an hour, you can just, you can already check the sodium. So there's no real need for you to say, wait for like three, four hours, wait for things to clear. Because when you're dealing with an emergency, you need to quickly check and determine whether there's a need to give. Understand. Um, and generally, I mean, bear in mind that our aim here is to correct by about four to five millimolar. When you use a formula of about uh, two per kg, uh, two mils per kg, you probably, each bolus probably will not raise the sodium by more than one or two millimolar. So it's generally safe. Okay. Yeah. But you shouldn't go beyond two millimolar because once you correct by more than a four to five millimolar, especially in chronic hyponatremia, generally the worry, uh, and I think most people will know is that we are worried about osmotic demyelination that occurs due to yep. overcorrection. Yeah. So okay. the focus in the immediate period is to re reduce the cerebral edema and bring the patient out of the emergency state. I see. Okay. So you also did mention that um, the symptomatic improvement may be a bit delayed. La. So sometimes yes. what you may see is the sodium improves and once we hit that four to five um, target, you would probably be um, careful and yes. give it some time for the symptomatic improvement to actually work yes. before giving further yep. um, hypertonic saline. Yep. Okay. And I, I, think, I think here, if we relate to the original point, if you see a loss in sodium about four to five, and the sodium, or, and rather the patient's clinical state doesn't quite improve, I think yep. that's when you need to reevaluate the cause of the delirium yep. in terms of whether there's something else that could be causing the altered mental status beyond just the sodium alone. Understand. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the next question that uh, we have here is, um, which patients actually require um, monitored care? So i.e. Um, at what level, um, based on what symptoms, do we need to consider like sending patients down to the high D uh, yeah. for monitoring? I think if you go back to the basics of um, auto mental status, I think when the patient loses the ability to protect their own airway, uh, that tends to be when they need the closer monitoring. Okay. Yeah, so um, I mean, we have given hypertonic saline both in the ICU setting and the general ward setting. Okay. So perhaps in the general setting will be more of a patient who is just a bit confused, mm -hmm. but chemonemically is still stable and, you know, holding saturation and it's not retaining CO2. Okay. By the time the patient is completely stuporous and in a coma and you're worried that the patient is going to like hyperventilation, type 2 respiratory failure, I think those are the ones who need closer monitoring. I see. So rather than looking at just the sodium as a number in itself, you would focus more on the clinical state of the patient. Yeah, yeah. I mean, although having said that, I think there are some people who say that anybody who needs hypertonic saline should go ICU. I think it's, uh, once again, it's expert opinion and it's very dependent on how many beds you have to begin with. Okay, sure. Got it. Yeah. Um, so next, we'll move on to the etiological evaluation. This is a slide that we uh, got from your slides. Uh, just for everyone to do a quick recap, um, the first thing that we look at in the evalu etiological evaluation is the osmolality status uh, of hyponatremia as to whether it's iso, hypo, or hypertonic. Um, so uh, Dr. Mock, I think the first question about osmolality is, um, do we use calculated or measured values and what's the reason? So, Okay, so um... Uh, if you, uh, maybe to me, you bring us back to the slide before this, sure. the one where you showed the flow chart. Okay, so I think just to get this out of the way, I mean, uh, we have all this um, very, uh, there's a very, there are all these nice arrows and diagrams telling you how to evaluate, but I think um, for for everyone's uh, ease, uh, most of the time when we manage, uh, manage hyponatremia, you're dealing with hypotonic hyponatremia, yep. meaning which is right down the middle. So um, the hypertonic and the isotonic ones, they are the uh, less common ones. So by far, most commonly, mo most commonly you're dealing with hypotonic or hyposmolar hyponatremia. Which then brings us to the original point about osmolality. Because the, the, and the reason why is because sodium is the key contributor to osmolality. If you look at most of your formulas, if you look at if effective osmolality is two times sodium plus glucose. So yep. most of the time when sodium is low, your patient has hyperosmolality. Yep. So the only reason why you have hyperosmolality is when there's an osmolar gap. There's something else that's effective or is exerting that osmolality. You know, things that causes high gap, you know, glucose, it's like the rarer things. 
So which then for means that most of the time, except for those uncommon situations, the calculated and measured osmolality should be not very different. Okay. And therefore, bearing that in mind, it's usually straightforward to just use the measured osmolality from the lab to just determine the osmolality uh, when assessing the etiology of hyponatremia. Okay, understand. Okay, I would say that the only caveat is when you have a patient with hyperglycemia. So that's the only difference. So okay. when you deal with hyperglycemia patient, uh, when you see the patient is having a high blood sugar and has hyponatremia, then you should do the correction based on the formulas that you should have in our uh, shared drive and, and our, our guidelines to tell you what is the corrected sodium. So okay. that corrected sodium tells you what the sodium should be when you render the patient euglycemic. So it is not what we classically call pseudo-hyponatremia. Yep. So the hyponatremia due to hyperglycemia is true hyper hyponatremia due to water being dragged in by the glucose. Okay. So in those instances, you should correct the glucose and see, okay, what the sodium will be. And let's say the patient is true hyponatremia, then you're dealing with something else. Lah. Meaning okay. there's something else in addition to hypo, 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 uh, hyperglycemia. Okay, got uh, it. Does that answer your questions? Yep, it does. Um, so apart from hyperglycemia, there shouldn't be any other instances where you have to calculate a corrected sodium, correct? Uh, yeah, I would say that's the only uh, etiology. I mean, going if you look at the flow diagram, I mean, most of the time, as I said, it's most of the time hypo or smaller hyponatremia. Yep. So if your osmolality to begin with is hypo or smaller, which is less than 280 in most instances, you go right down the middle path. But okay. if let's say you are dealing with a patient with normal osmolality or hyper osmolality, then that becomes very un unusual. That's when you start to think about the hyperosmolality. We think the first thing, the most important thing, would be glucose because that's a common thing. The less okay. common things like all these post TURP or um, syndromes or patients who are mannitol, that the context usually gives away the answer. Sure. Then when osmolality okay. is normal, then you think about the hyperosmolar ones, and you also think about the pseudo hyponatremia, the lipids, the myeloma patients. We tend to see a lot of it in the hematology patients with myeloma when you check the sodium and it's low, and then you check the osmolality is normal. Then they start to think, okay, it's because of the paraproteins. Okay, I think you've sort of answered the, the next question, but maybe you could just give us a quick refresher as to what exactly is pseudo hyponatremia. Like you also rightly pointed out earlier, some people okay. throw the term loosely around because they call okay. um, like hyperglycemia uh, induced hyponatremia pseudo when yes. it isn't really pseudo. So maybe okay. you can just clarify things on that. Sure, sure. Um, I need to show that picture because this one is really a situation when the picture beats a thousand words. Sure. Uh, do you want to try to screen share? Yeah, I will try to do that. Uh, I'll pull it out on my side if you can't. Can you all see that? Uh, one second. Uh, I stop share. Yes, I can see it. <laughs> yep. Okay. So, um, this is a diagram that will help you understand this idea of pseudo hyponatremia. So, when you run a regular renal panel, okay, uh, this is the blood sample. Okay, can you all see the, my arrow as well? Okay, so this is your average blood sample that's taken. And usually in an average individual, the water to solid distribution of 70 to 30%. So using this uh, assumption, the lab adds a fixed amount of diluent to dilute all the samples so that you don't need so much of blood to run the test. So this is what, you, what the lab does when we run a regular renal panel and measure sodium. In the, in the patients with hypertriglyceridemia or paraproteins, what happens then is that the solid phase is increased. So in the same volume of blood, you have actually have a lower amount of plasma with a lower amount of electrolyte. And when you add in the same amount of diluent, this dilutes out the amount of salt. And so therefore, what you see is that uh, the, the, the measured amount of sodium is actually lower than what it is in, in reality. And this is just purely because of the altered distribution between water and solids due to the contribution by the triglycerides and the paraprotein. Understand. So this is, and, and to unmask this, then what you need to do is directly measure the amount of sodium here without uh, diluting. And the only way you can do that is to run the eye stat in the, I, the ICUs. Lah. So okay. usually when you have patients who suspect pseudohyponatremia when osmolality is normal, when you run the eye stat that directly measures it, you will show the true sodium and then you can go, uh, you can use that number to guide your management. Because if the eye stat shows the normal sodium, then there's no problem. Okay, got it. Yep. And uh, about hyperosmolar uh, causes of hyponatremia? Okay, so uh, so when you talk about hyperosmolar causes of hyponatremia, so this the classic example, as I said, is hyperglycemia. So if you look at A here, which is the equilibrated state, the distribution between your ECF and your ICF, 
So here in D, the squares here are, are, are basically glucose. So when you have extra something that exerts an osmotic effect, it pulls water from the ICF into the ECF. Okay. So this additional water that's put then dilute out the same amount of salt, causing a picture of hyponatremia. Okay. It is true hyponatremia in that the salt is really being diluted in the in the in, in vivo. Okay. This is different in and in contrast to the pseudo hyponatremia when the dilution is in vitro. Understand. Okay. So okay. In, and therefore in hyperglycemia, it is a true hyponatremia. And this is the case as with when patient is given mannitol to relieve uh, intracranial pressure or when they have extra glycine that's circulating in the body after TURP. So in those instances, uh, the way to treat the hyponatremia will be to basically treat the underlying problem. You need to metabolize the glucose and then slowly support with fluids as classically in patients with hyperglycemia, like, be it crisis or non-crisis. Got it. Okay, thank you. So that's the difference. Okay. Um, I switched the screen share. Is that okay? Sure, sure, sure. Please go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Ken. So, um, so next we will shift gears a bit. So once mm. again, this is also adopted uh, from your slides that were taken mm. from the European uh, paper. Uh, so for, for the next part that we want to talk about um, would be uh, about understanding interpretation of uh, urinary studies. Mm. Like, Mm, mm. So, she and you want to ask? Okay, so for the urinary studies, when do we actually send it? So, okay. like, there's some people who actually say we need to make sure the patient is due for volumic first before we can send the workup. So, when do we actually send it? Okay. Um, so, if we go back to the previous point saying that most of the time we are dealing with hypo or smaller hyponatremia, uh, then what you will realize that in that diagram that you showed, the dichotomy or trichotomy occurs by assessing the patient's clinical volume status. Yep. Whether it is euvolemic, overloaded, or dehydrated. It works on that assumption. And it works on the assumption that you can clinically tell a difference. Yep. And a lot of times, okay, so I think put it this way. When a patient comes in with florid fluid overload, um, uh, or say with anasaka with nephrotic syndrome, or they have decompensated liver cirrhosis, those are the states whereby it's outrightly overloaded. You don't need labs to guide your treatment. And the treatment will just be treating the underlying problem and you die, you risk the sodium should get better. Okay, so those are the instances whereby you probably don't need to send um, your urine and serum sodium osmolality to determine whether, uh, whether this is intravascular depletion or whether this is, say, ADH excess. Yep. But in patients who you think is dehydrated, uh, and when the BP especially is stable, mm. I think those are the ones where you really need to think about working up. Yep. Because uh, in the supposedly dehydrated patient who truly has, say, SID or something else, those are the ones who you either A, miss an opportunity to diagnose an underlying problem like hypocortisolism. And in those instances, when you give them isotonic saline, which is classically done when you assume it's hyponatremia due to dehydration, the sodium always worsens. So I would say to put it simply, if you have a patient who you don't think you can judge their volume status is a well, and when the sodium is low enough, and by, by that I mean, and if you have a sodium, you have a patient with sodium or anything less than 125, you should always evaluate. You cannot assume that this is just due to dehydration. Simply because dehydrational, uh, vascular uh, volume depletion related hyponatremia is uncommon. And it's usually something you see when patients have at least 20-30% 30, 30 volume contraction. So in those cases, the patient has to be quite high, like hypotensive. So if you have a patient with um, like fairly normal BP, is fairly well, and the sodium is very low, uh, you should really work up uh, with those tests that we talked about. I understand. Um, I think Shian also specifically asked about the timing. Should we send it ah, like, okay. um, in ED, when the patient first touches down to us after hydrating for one day, um, after you optimize fluid status, what's your uh, guidance on that? Um, so yeah, I think okay. What this this is once again. Um, there's no RCT that looks at this. Mm -hmm. Um, and I know I mean anecdotally, people will worry about okay, what will the drip do to my patient's osmolality? Uh, what how will, will there be time for things to equilibrate before I test? Um, so I think first and foremost, the urine sodium and urine osmolality will not be altered by the drip. Uh, uh, I mean. I just cannot see how it will. Uh, and, 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 and the thing is that the plasma osmolality, so long as it's not taking from the drip arm, 
I don't think there's any problem with tracking it, uh, regardless of what whether the patient is or not on a drip or when and and whenever the patient presents. Uh, uh, and ultimately, the earlier you do the test, you the 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 better you are able to interpret uh, the results and then make a diagnosis. I suppose the only caveat would be if let's say your patients are is on diuretics. Mm. So when patients are is on diuretics, um, it will be harder to interpret things like urinary sodium because um, they will alter the urine sodium. Uh, and urine sodium is important because that's the chief uh, test that helps us to d- d- differentiate between a patient who is dehydrated versus a patient who has, say, uh, SIDH. Okay. So I think the, the use of diuretics would be probably the only caveat. Okay. Yeah, so bottom line, you can test any time. Okay. okay. Then if the patient is on diuretics, then how long do we have to hold it off for before we can send these studies? Mm, okay, so I think the way to look at it is that... Um, so, uh, I think if you go back to the origin, so it depends on why we need to do the test and whether we really... So, if the patient has already been on a diuretic for an underlying problem, like say CKD, heart failure, uh, and, uh, uh, and they are admitted for uh, something that happened to the treatment, but they are overloaded clinically, right? Then you usually don't need to do the test because um, clinical judgment tells you that the patient is overloaded for um, the, the uh, decompensation based on any trigger. So you treat the trigger and you die your release. So usually in those contexts, the urinary sodium is not necessary. Okay? Okay. But if let's say you have a patient who is on pusamide and comes in and you clinically clean, clean, clean think the patient is really euvolemic, mm. then you will need to do the test. Lah. And I will say that then you test and look at the results. So usually we use a urine sodium of more than 30 as a guide to determine whether this is volume depletion or volume contraction. Yeah. So if I would say that, okay, and it depends on really when was the last dose the FUSMA was given and how, uh, how much it was given. I, we don't have a clear-cut number to say how long after it has been stopped, then you can test. Um, if the patient's urine sodium is low in spite of being on diuretic, meaning let's say your urine sodium is 10 and the patient is on the regular diuretic, then quite clearly this patient is volume depleted. Okay. Then I would treat as for volume depletion and give a trial of like isotonic saline. But if the urine sodium is high, then that's when I will ask myself, okay, is it high because of the diuretic or are there any clues to suggest that this is, um, say, SI, still possibly an SIDH picture? That's when I look at the other things like the urine osmolality and look at potential surrounding causes. So I think it's about whether you can, whether you look at any other meter beyond that just where one urine sodium. Uh, and I think subsequently in your future slide, you, you also talk about things like uh, uric acid and urea, right? Uh, so, those are the other things that we potentially try to use um, to, 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 to overcome uh, the, 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 the influence of diuretics on sodium. Okay. Yeah, because okay. potentially you can use urea and uric acid and measure fractional excretion to say, okay, if fractional excretion is high, then this is not dehydration. But if fractional excretion is low, meaning the body is retaining, then it's dehydration. So those are the things that we potentially get, although it's not commonly done. So they are sort of adjuncts uh, on yes. top of... Yes, I think those are adjuncts that mm-hmm. we sometimes consider but we don't use. I would say that the easiest way to answer your question would be uh, look at the clinical context and when you, look inter- when you interpret the result, if the sodium is low, in spite of diuretic use, it's very telling because the patient is really dehydrated. But when the urine sodium is high when the patient is on diuretics, um, uh, you might have to hold it off and recheck a couple of days' time and then think, okay, uh, uh, and see how you respond to the treatment. If the sodium goes down in spite of you getting isotonic saline, then chances are this is not dehydration. Okay. Um, okay, just to shift gears a bit, um, do you mind just telling us specifically um, what the urinary sodium implies and what the urinary osm implies? Because for a lot of people, they just lump it as, oh, this is SIADH workup, and then I just mm. look at the cutoffs, and then, oh, if it meets the cutoff, it's SIADH kind of thing. So maybe yeah. you could take us through, uh, from a more conceptual point of view, what each of it yeah. is. Okay, am, am I still on the share screen? Uh, you, I'll help you. Yeah, you can share screen right now. You can see this uh, yes. fancy table here? Yep, I can. Okay, so I think this is, okay, I'll first use this to help us understand the role of the osmolality here. Mm. So, um, osmolality, okay, so osmolality is, uh, is concentration and, uh, of, the elect- of the solutes and this is regulated by ADH. Yep. Uh, so, if you look at this, basically this graph here it tries to uh, compare the relationship between your plasma osmolality and how much of ADH is produced. Uh, here, ADH and AVP are synonymous. Yep. And correspondingly, what's the concentration of urine that's produced? 
Okay. So the yellow box here represents your normal osmolality that the body tries to keep uh, within in terms of normal homeostasis. So it's about 280 to 295. Right? Yep. And corresponding to that, you will see that the body produces a certain amount of ADH to regulate the amount of free water that is collected at the collecting ducts. Okay. Okay. So when your osmolality goes above 295, when you're becoming dehydrated, they produce more ADH to try and recollect more uh, water. And therefore, the urine, osme the urine, concentration, the urine uh, volume goes down. Yep. And the concentration of urine goes all the way up to about 1,200. Okay. And this is the same trigger that makes you want to drink. Okay. Mm -hmm. So conversely, now if let's say you try to drink tons of water, you drink a liter a day, a liter an hour, you just keep drinking and drinking and drinking. So the, potentially this brings the, the serum osmolality down. And then what happens is that correspondingly, the body shuts down the amount of ADH that's being produced. Yep. Right? And this goes down to as low as 100. Okay. Right? So uh, by the time your serum osmolality is lower than 280, your body should be producing next to no ADH and your urine osmolality should be, a le should be less than 100. Yep. Understand. Okay? So if you recall what we say that most hyponatremia are hypoosmolar or hypotonic, so in most of our patients, when you see hyponatremia, the osmolality is less than 280, right? Yep. Okay. So going by this physiology, if your patient is able to regulate ADH production, when the serum osmolality is less than 280, when you check the urine osmolality, it should ideally be less than 100. Understand. Yep. Right? So in anybody whose serum osmolality is less than 280, but when you measure the urine osmolality is more than 100, you know there must be a problem with ADH regulation. Okay. Yeah, so the, the urine osmolality of more than 100 tells you that there's an ADH excess that's mediating the hyponatremia that you're seeing. Okay? Then the next question would be, okay, now that I know that if let's say the urine osmolality, let's say is 400, okay, um, which is more than 100, then the next question you ask is, okay, then how do I know whether this is due to dehydration or whether this is due to, say, SIADH or the other causes like hypocortisolism or hypothyroidism? Yep. Because what we know is that in extreme volume contraction, um, usually the first thing that kicks in is your renin angiotensin aldosterone system that, that basically reabsorbs sodium to preserve volume. Yep. Right? But in extreme volume contraction, they also recruit the ADH system to try and preserve volume. Yes. Right? And what you see on the next slide, okay, let me see, I'm going to flip through all this. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. So what you see here is that this blue bar here in the middle relates to what we just saw. So in this blue bar, at the plasma osmolality of 280, you will see that no ADH is produced. Okay. Right? Mm. But when your patient is volume contracted by a certain portion, this curve shifts to the left. And what you see, therefore, is that in spite of having osmolality of 280, the body still continues to produce ADH to preserve volume. Okay. Right? So in those instances, when the patient truly has hyponatremia that due to dehydration, the urine sodium will be low, less than 30. So the distinguishing point would be that therefore if the patient who is not dehydrated, when the urine osmolality is more than 100, the urine sodium should be more than 30. Okay. So the two magic numbers therefore to remember would be a urine osmolality of 100 and a urine sodium of 30. All right. So when you mentioned dehydrated, this uh, actually means effective uh, arterial circulation means that things like, let's say, heart failure, cirrhosis yeah. also will cause... Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So you're absolutely right. So which is why if you go back to the table that you, okay, I'm trying to move, if you go back to that trichotomy thing that you showed, right? Yep. Um, under here, your hypervolemic state patients, right? Okay, meaning they're overloaded clinically, like, but they, as you rightly put, the effective circulating volume might be low. Yep. In heart failure, there is low because the pump is failing. In patients with cirrhosis and narcotic syndrome, because of hyperalbuminemia and loss of narcotic pressure, they third space and the effective volume is low. So okay. in those patients, invariably, the urine sodium will be low as well. Okay. Absolutely. I mean, but as I said, usually there's no, I mean, we can still do the test, but a lot of times the tests are not so uh, of value because they are already clinically so yeah. overloaded. There's primary edema and blue infusion. You, you can just die your risk and treat the underlying problem. Okay. Um, and the lead on question would be, because you did mention, I think oftentimes where we struggle is patients who have an element of dehydration on the background of ADH, uh, SIADH rather. So yes. in those instances, is there value in repeating the urinary studies to see how the urinary studies respond to yeah. hydration and how do we interpret in those instances? Okay, so 
it is possible. So, okay, in patients with SIADH, uh, let's say the patient is just chronic SIADH because of medications they're taking or because of old age, we know that some elderly patients, they just have SIADH. Yeah. So what happens is that usually in those patients, they, their baseline sodium is low one, you know, meaning they are not normal. Their baseline sodium is like, say, 130, 131. Um, and when they drink a bit more water, the sodium will go lower because they cannot clear the free water. Mm. All right? But they can always get admitted for an acute medical problem that causes high uh, volume contraction. Yeah. So then what you see is that the, essentially in those patients, their curve shifts. Uh, so uh, this curve. So yeah. let's say they were already, they were on, they, their baseline is like, let's say here, then suddenly it shifted to this way because yeah. of dehydration. So in those instances, those are the ones, let's say when you do the initial SIDH workup, it shows a picture of dehydration, right? Okay. So then you will go on to hydrate them uh, and then hydrate them. So I think the point where you need to start thinking about re-evaluating is when you persist with the dehydration, you see that the sodium starts to drop. Okay. Because when you hydrate them to a certain point and the sodium starts to drop, you know that you have replenished them and the curve has shifted back. I see. And therefore, the body has re regulated such that now they no longer need to use ADH to retain volume. They are now just guiding by osmolality once again. And okay. therefore, therefore uh, it comes to a point whereby you recheck and therefore, and when you recheck it, then it might show now an ADH picture. So that's when you need to back off on IV hydration and reinstate whatever volume contraction, uh, volume, uh, uh, volume uh, uh, depletion, uh, volume uh, restriction, uh, sorry and manage the unlike acute tr trigger. La. Understand. So that's probably the basis where people say you volume replete to do your SIADH workup uh, because that's when um, the initial dehydration picture on the urine studies may now be uh, re reveal the SIADH picture after you yeah, have yeah. volume repeat. Yeah, but la. I think having said that, um, one important point to bear in mind is that I think most of the time uh, we see people giving isoponic saline when they see a patient with hyponatremia. Yep. And this is irrespective of whether they had a diagnosis of SIDH to be given or not. Because uh, the, 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 the running narrative is that, oh, this is likely due to dehydration. Let's try first and see what happens. Yep. Um, I, I think if you understand uh, what we have said so far, most uh, hyponatremia due to volume contraction itself is not so common. And by far, in fact, most of the time when you deal with inpatient hyponatremia, a lot of it is due to SIDH. Understood. Because many of the things we, that cause SIDH, the acute respiratory illness, the nausea, the pain, the medications, a lot of these are very dominant factors and therefore they drive the SIDH. Okay. I would say that um, if the patient is not hemodynamically unstable, all right, and you don't have a pressing need to give a drip, when dealing with a patient with hyponatremia, you are better off working up first okay. uh, to be clear about the etiology uh, before giving the drip. Understand. Simply because the drip can make the sodium worse. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. I think Any you, other asked, you asked the question, yes. uh, you answered the question just now on when to stand if there's um, if the patient's already on diuretic, but like, or what if the patient has the underlying cirrhosis and also kidney disease? Yeah. So, so for those patients, I mean, we have seen before whereby let's say the sodium is low enough. Let's say because they have very profound, like advanced liver failure and cirrhosis. So we have seen um, the primary team sending the, 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 the evaluation. What often happens is that you tend to see a picture of in volume depletion, uh, meaning yeah. the urine sodium is low the urine osmolality is high because ADH is being recruited to preserve volume. So if you ask me the question, then how does it change management? Mm. Um, it probably doesn't because ultimately, the, you, it will not go away so long as the liver has failed because the reason why the, it's happening is because there's hypoalbuminemia. Mm. So the only way to reverse it is to restore the, and restore the albumin levels and pull the free water out. But it's very difficult in patients with cirrhosis because... Um, the liver failure is a root problem. So the okay. only way to get them better is um, go for a liver transplant. I mean, I, I'm sorry that if I put it too simply. <laughs> but uh, what I would say is that in all these patients with severe hyponatremia, it could be cirrhosis or nephrotic syndrome or SIDH, 
um, going back to the very original point about severe hyponatremia and altered mental status, regardless of etiology, if you think the hyponatremia is the cause uh, of the altered mental status, giving them hypotonic saline will always get them better, regardless of etiology. Mm. So you get them better first, but you sometimes they slowly work out the underlying cause. Okay. But let's say in instances like, let's say, kidney disease, let's say this patient has a bit of, let's say, uh, AKI, mm. uh, and, um, and maybe, let's say, some dehydration, but you don't know whether there's a concomitant SIADH. Although I understand the definition of SIADH shouldn't have renal impairment. But yeah, um, yeah so is, or rather, is, there a, 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 is it important to evaluate for inappropriate ADH um, stimulation in the context of these diseases? And if so, then, uh, like, for, for if there's renal disease, do you then use a FINA instead of, a, like, spot urinary sodium instead? Um, I guess that's the drift of the question. Well, I think this one is difficult. You probably need to ask oh. a nephrologist, but <laughs> a lot of times, okay, so a lot of times when the patient has, uh, I mean, if it's advanced CKD, those stage 5, 1, those, it's quite easy. We usually just attribute it to, like, re flu re renal failure. Yeah. Uh, we... We sometimes irrespective of what the urine the, the urine study show because we don't know how it, it, the accuracy is altered by the renal failure. Mm. We just assume it's due to renal failure. Yeah. I think when you have those patients with milder like stage three CKD, then when we see hyponatremia and we try to interpret, um, we assume it's still normal. You can still uh, assess uh, based on what we talked about just now. All those yeah. values. Um, to be honest, I hardly actually ever use the phenol, the fractional excretion okay. of sodium. Okay. Uh, you can try asking Hong Rui. I know Hong Rui, Hong Rui uh, talks about, uh, a lot about this. Okay. Uh, so okay. in your next episode, you can ask him about sure. it. <laughs> but, Sounds good. Sounds but, good. But, but, the, but the general principle would be, to, and the phenol, the principle of the phenol is very much related to the urea and the urea as I said. Hmm. Yeah, okay. So you look for fractional excretion. If it's retaining, then you assume it's volume depletion. If it's uh, higher than the threshold, you assume it's due to there's no evidence of volume depletion. Okay, got it. Thank you. Um, so the thing about SIADH, right? Um, so based on uh epidemiology, what are the commonest causes? And the other thing is um, how hard should we um hunt for a cause? Cause sometimes you say you got a bit of pain, a bit of nausea. Mm, mm, uh, mm. then say that's the cause of the SIADH. But yeah. when do we need to hunt for more sinister things like brain problems, lung problems? Yeah. So okay. what's your approach to this? So I think maybe if we take a step back, um, important, the important thing to bear in mind is SIDH is a diagnosis of exclusion. Mm. Um, so when you have a patient with hypoosmolar hyponatremia, uh, when the urine osmolality is more than 100, your urine sodium is more than 30, that's the picture of ADH excess. Yep. Right? Then you ask the question, okay, um, what is driving this? So usually the important thing to exclude would be hypocortisolism, hypothyroidism, and the use of thiazide diuretics. So yep. these are the three specific things that mimic the SIDH picture. So once you've done your say cortisol, thyroid function test, and you check a drug history and exclude thyroid use, okay, then okay, then you can be fairly certain that this is SIDH. Uh, in terms of etiology, um, the okay, actually a lot, a big um, a proportion of them are actually idiopathic. Uh, okay. because it's either because um, people have different differing treasures how far they pursue the etiology as you asked. Uh, or it's just really due to uh, old age senescence that there's an aging of or the hypothesis is that there's an aging of the hypothalamus so the threshold is altered so the patient has a sodium that's lower and that always causes the, 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 the uh, body to secrete ADH the, I would say the commoner causes that you will see would be usually uh, an acute infection like chest infection you know anything that's chest related sepsis uh, patients who are on ventilators uh, okay. uh, another common uh, trigger will be pain and trauma okay. as well as nausea of any sort so classically okay. you see you know, patients who under the surgical ward let's say that trauma then they're given analgesia and they're nauseous nausea is a very potent trigger of ADH okay. uh, then in addition the classical list of drugs all your SSRI trigus, uh, the, the tricyclic antidepressants uh, and uh, some other chemo drugs a lot of them cause SIDH uh. So okay. I would say usually you have to take a history and look down the medical medication list uh, to figure out whether there's any trigger. Okay. Uh, and I mean ultimately cancer like your parent the plastic. Uh, not yeah. to mention. Okay. Then we going back to your original question. How hard do we pursue a cause? Uh? I think they're very variable. So uh, minimally we look at the medication list. Yeah. We examine the patient uh, to look for any chest etiology. We do a chest X-ray. 
brain imaging, I think, is very, is very subjective. Okay. I mean, I will do a focus, I will do a neurological exam, but how much it tells me whether I'm missing out on a CNS lesion, I don't know. Okay. Um, some, I think some, some endocrinologists will go as far as say that everybody must have a CT brain. Okay. I don't think it is a universally agreed uh, 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 practice. Um, I think then what's more important is that if we look at the whole, all the list of SIDH, the most sinister thing you worry about are CNS lesion and malignancy. So taking a, a good history, checking for constitutional symptoms and have the patient return if let's say they don't, they start developing new symptoms that will guide you in doing a more focused evaluation. Okay. I think that's about it. But I wouldn't go as far as say that you must bundle blast and do it for yep. CT brain for all patients. Okay. So those with pain, nausea and all that, the SIDH tends to be relieved quite quickly once you address these things? Yeah, so absolutely. So the, the, when you manage SID, apart from all the classical fluid restriction, a lot of it is determined by your etiology. So okay. the, for those patients with pain, nausea, and infection, the more you treat those things, the ADH trigger comes down. Usually the urine osmolality comes down. Okay. Then they are able to pass out the free water. Okay. But for those patients who have unfortunately a paraneoplastic uh, condition due to say advanced malignancy, those are the ones that will persist. Okay. Because the urine osmolality is locked at a high level because the ADH trigger is persistently there. Okay, got it. Yeah. Thank you. Next, we'll talk about monitoring and troubleshooting. Yeah. So, just now you mentioned, let's say the, the causes have been identified and they're yeah. potentially reversible, then how often like, should we repeat the urinary studies again? And how, mm. should, how often should we monitor these patients? Um, okay, so... Uh, if we talk about, I mean, I'm using an example of hypo or smaller hypo and femia due to SIDH because that's the commonness uh, that we deal with. So, uh, if we understand that the hypo occurs due to free water excess, you know, they cannot excrete the free water. So, the improvement comes when they gradually excrete more and more free water. Mm. So, really, the monitoring uh, boils down to first assessing the mental state because you know, if the patient initially like had to uh, be compromised on the CNS, then you make sure that CNS is stable day to day. Yeah. Uh, then you look at the weight. The yeah. daily weight will tell you because if the weight goes down, then you know that they're clearing the free water, and then that relates to the uh, IO. Yeah. Uh, to make sure that the IO goes down. In terms of how frequently you monitor the sodium, mm. um, there's uh okay, there's no hard and fast rule, but the yeah. severe hyponatremia ones that you deal with that you have to rescue initially. You probably have to do to do four to six hourly initially. Okay. Once they are more stable, uh, we tend to do it maybe like once we go like we go from once uh, like twelve hourly to once a day, mm. when we have a certain sense of how fast they rise. And okay. the general rule of thumb in terms of how fast they allow you to rise is about six to eight every twenty four hours. You want okay. to aim for that kind of rise. Uh, with uh, slow rise with your fluid streak and that tends to be the tempo when you're dealing with most SIDH uh, okay. as the underlying trigger resolves. The faster rise in sodium occurs when you deal with some other things like hypocholesterolism when you give the steroids and you can see sometimes the, the urine pours out very very fast. Okay. And those are the ones when the sodium rise much more quickly and usually that's when you need to call us. So I think the, the, the way to look at it is that if your urine output rise to more than 100 mils per hour. And usually that's very telling, right? Because the urine volume just suddenly shoots up. That's when the sodium will be expected to go up very fast. That's when you need to call for help. Yep. Because we will use other measures, like we may start infusing the patient with ISO or hypotonic saline and give other things to try and dampen the rate of rise of sodium. Okay. I think you've answered quite a bit of the next set of questions because alongside monitoring will be troubleshooting, right? So you did mention mm. that Let's say hypocortisolism, when you give the steroids, that's one of yes. uh, these patients who are susceptible to correcting right. very quickly. Uh, yes. What about these patients, like let's say those with nausea and pain, where ah. um, you relieve their symptoms quite well, yes. do these patients tend to also um, correct very quickly and start pouring out urine? Okay, those, those don't tend to because, um, I mean, the, the, the relief of the symptom is more gradual, I would suppose, and 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 the you is not so so you don't immediately address. Meaning to say, the trigger will gradually dissipate. Sure. Unlike unlike the hypocortisolism, where they very quickly restore the normal steroid levels. Uh. So a lot of times for those patients, what we do is that we find the cause, we fluid restrict them a bit, and we see that once the sodium is gradually going upwards we feel that we are comfortable to this, let them go home and we let them go home. Then we see them within say a couple of weeks uh, and the whole time we tell them to restrict the fluids and we might check the sodium and look at the urine osmolality. 
by the time they come back, if let's say the sodium has normalized and the urine alternative is normal, we can tell them, okay, fine, you can just go back to the normal life and eat and drink as you wish to. Because the trigger for ADH access is no longer there. Okay. Um, and you also were alluding to um, some of the different things you can do to uh, modulate the rate of rise. Um, what are some of these options that you have if, let's say, patients are rising too quickly? Okay, so first of all, I'll say uh, the disclaimer is that this do not try them at home. I mean, don't okay, try sure. the measures to, to, to moderate the rate of rise. It's more importantly, more importantly is that you watch out for things that tell you that the rate of rise is coming. Okay. And I think what we talked about, the urine uh, output and yep. the etiology, more yep. so in uh, hypocholesterolism. Yep. So what we sometimes do, okay, and I don't always have, I have not, it's all of this described in books. Yeah. So we either start infusing the patient with isotonic and hypotonic saline to try and prevent the sodium from going up. Mm. Uh, we may even do things like give patient DDAVP or desmopressin. So we restore some ADH so that they will retain some of this free water. Yeah. So, and in a, in a bit to prevent the rate of rise. But usually these are done in very controlled measure, methods and we just do for a short while. I see. Yeah. Uh, what so, about things like just a, a dextrose uh, drip and stuff like that. Do you all use these yeah, things? So, so the dextrose drip will fall under the use of hypotonic uh, fluids. Okay. So, hypotonic. So, that's, yeah, so that's probably, that's something that potentially can do. But I will say that um, because a lot of times the trouble will be, it's very hard to gauge how much you need to give. Sure. So uh, whatever we give, we probably will just give a small amount like say, over twelve hours, a little or a little over 24 hours. Mm-hmm. And then we quickly recheck the sodium and then we look at the IOs and then we try to determine, okay, will we increase or reduce it? Okay. So the take-home for the residents would be to know when to escalate. La. And normally these yes. practices will be done yeah. in conjunction with um, consult with the endocrinologist. Absolutely. So I, 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 absolutely, I think you're, you're, you're right spot on that in that it's more important to look out for the real rise, which is more than 6 to 8 to 24 hours. And when you see the urine pause up more than 100 mils per hour, that we need to escalate and uh, maybe ask someone to look at a patient. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so moving on to the treatment of SIADH, I think most of us know it's fluid restriction and sometimes we give the sodium dextrose tablets. So actually, how much should we fluid restrict and when do we start sodium tablets and how does the sodium dextrose tablets actually work? That's a very good question. <laughs> so, uh, okay, maybe, uh, what, how do you all think the sodium chloride tablets work? My understanding is that it facilitates uh, natural resist and then it helps with uh, getting rid of excess free water rather than um, yeah. increasing the sodium per se. Yeah, so, 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 the, okay, so you see, I, I think we, should, we keep going back to this point about um, hypo or smaller hyponatremia. I mean, this is the commonest called hyponatremia, right? And therefore, if you understand it, the true problem is, while the number is low sodium, the true problem is free water excess. It's yeah. not a matter of sodium deficiency. Yeah. So the, 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 the way out of the problem will be to help the patient clear the free water. So how much of fluid you actually have to restrict the patient is then dependent on how high the urine osmolality is mm-hmm. and how much of osmolites the patient is taking every day. So put it this way, I mean, if you do an SIDH workout for two patients, a patient with a urine osmolality of 400 and a urine patient of urine osmolality of 800 is very different. Yeah. Because the patient with urine osmolality of 800 can only put out half the amount of free water compared to the patient with urine osmolality of 400. Understand. Right? Yeah, you follow me? So yeah. the higher the urine osmolality, the less the amount of water you can drink. Because you drink a little bit, you have already tipped over how much your body can put out. Yeah. Then the second thing would be how much of um, osmolite that the patient is uh, eating. Because when you have a urine osmolality of 400, it means that every time your body tries to pee out one liter of urine, it must be bound to 400 minimums osmolite. Yep. Right. Uh, so the 800 one will be 800. So the 800 one is also stuck again because you need to eat much more to, mm. but to, 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 have, to, 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 to clear the free water. So uh, the, the higher, so I would say that generally, a lot of time we give it arbitrary one to 1.5 liter. Yep. It's completely guesswork. Mm. So, um, I would say the higher the urine osmolality, the lower the amount the patient can drink. Okay. Yeah. And so uh, when you see a urine osmolality, so usually the way around it is to fluid restrict, 
and have the patient take more osmolite, which is why you see us ordering high protein diet because okay. the protein is cleared to become urea and that's the thing that is bound to water and clear. And this is usually the challenge in patients with advanced cancer because they are nauseous because of the chemo drug and the cancer makes them uh, unable to eat because they're anorexic to begin with. So okay. that's the major challenge we think SIADH related to cancer. Uh, and therefore, then finally answering the question of sodium chloride, that you try fluid restriction uh, after a certain period of time when we see that the sodium doesn't come down because the patient is unable to clear the free, clear the free water, especially when the urine osmolality is high, especially when the patient is not eating well. That so the sodium tablets becomes the protein. It becomes the thing that drags the water out. Okay. Yeah, so we only add on the sodium chloride tablets having tried a, a period of, of fluid restriction and failed and knowing that it's not going to be any time. Okay. So, because if you know that the trigger by getting away with fluid restriction, there's no real need to give the sodium chloride tablets because things will get better. But if your underlying problem is not going to go away uh, and severe, then we need to give something to uh, basically tide the patient over. Lah. So when you say serum osm is high, what I mean, I know there's no specific cutoff, lah, but what kind of numbers are you looking at that we would need to consider okay. much tighter? So, uh, okay, so uh, here we're talking about the urine osmolality, sorry. So yep. you, okay, so, okay. Um, there's no, uh, there's no, I mean, I would say it's like you can categorize in the mild, moderate, severe. Like, you know, knowing that our urine osmolality can go up to as high as 1,200, Usually your mild SIDH are those with the urine osmolality like 200 plus, 300 plus. The okay. moderate ones are probably the 500 plus, 600 plus. Then when you're in the range of like 700 plus, 800 plus, those are the, wow, the quite severe one already. So the severity okay. here means how refractory it is. And that's okay. really determined by the urine osmolality. Yeah. Understand. Um, some sources like up to date talks about like urine serum, urine serum cation ratios to help to guide um, the amount of certain tablets you give and stuff like that. Do we normally use these things or it's more of a give a bit and see how they respond like a bit like uh, trial and error? I'll be of. frank and say that uh, I'm not very aware of that uh, the, 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 the equation that you talked about. Mm. Particularly because they, they, they made a lot of assumptions in terms of total body water and weight. So it's yep. very hard to gauge. So a lot of times we just try a small amount like one tap BB and mm. see how the sodium rise and then the mantra is always start low, go slow, slowly titrate up. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, rather than give a big dose. And, and I would say that anytime you discharge a patient, let's say you start the sodium chloride tablets and let's say you want to discharge the patient, right? Somebody should eventually review the patient and decide whether it needs to be continued or not. It shouldn't be just one of those you just send to a black hole because yeah. we have seen patients who are continuing on sodium chloride indefinitely. Yeah. And the patient don't even know why. Okay. The only patient who will need to stay on it long term would be patients with chronic hyponatremia that's severe enough and with theology that's chronic that we cannot manage. Then we may give them chronic sodium chloride tablets. But by and large, most of the other patients don't need the chronic sodium chloride tablets. Okay. Uh, and if let's say fluid restriction and salt tablets uh, fail, do we have any other options? Okay. Um, well, in the American literature, they will give, other than sodium chloride tablets, they give this thing called urea powder, which we don't have. So they will dilute this uh, not very nice tasting urine powder and make patient drink. So it's akin to giving sodium chloride tablets. Okay. Um, the other things that are available uh, are the VEPTANS, the group of medication that are ADH receptor antagonists. Mm. Um, so to VEPTAN, um, uh, for as an example, we don't use it um, particularly because um, f firstly it's costly. Yep. Uh, B, uh, most of the time we are able to get by with the other measures we've talked about uh, and see uh, in terms of the, the outcome the, 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 the trials that I'm aware of don't show any benefits in terms of mortality or quality of life when you use the vet pens uh. so okay. we have not it's not something that we actively use okay got it thanks um, okay so we've come to our last slide uh, Shen, do you have any other last questions before we ask Okay, so Dr. Mok, do you have any take-home points for the residents when it comes to hyponatremia? Uh... Um, okay, let me see. Uh, I would say that um, most importantly, um, remember that most of the hyponatremia that we're dealing with is hypo or smaller. Yeah. And remember, uh, firstly, most importantly, ask the question, is this severe or not severe as determined by the mental status because severity tells you that you must do something about it and rescue but always escalate. 
And then in terms of etiology, um, hypo nitrimia due to dehydration is way overrated. It is okay. way, way, way overdiagnosed. So please don't assume every single hypo nitrimia due to dehydration. Most of the time, in fact, it's not going to be. Okay. And uh, most of the time, it is hypo or small hypo nitrimia, and by far, it is SIDH, but it's a diagnostic exclusion. So always think yeah. of the hypocortisolism, hypothyroidism, um, and thyroid use. And finally, when the sodium is low enough, less than 125 always investigate so don't mm-hmm. assume that this is dehydration treatment because the saline that you give will worsen the sodium and may cause the patient to be cause going to uh, AMS so right. so long as the sodium is less than 125 always evaluate and there's no, never usually a, a reason why you don't need to evaluate because and usually there's no pressing need to give fluids unless the patient is hemodynamically unstable Okay, thanks so much. Um, I have one last question. So you mentioned, uh, with regard to um, administration of uh, hypertonic saline, right? Yes. When the sodium is very low, but mentation-wise, they're actually okay. In those instances, um, do you give? Is there a role for it? Okay, so when the patient is, when the sodium is very low, okay, let's say we are talking about one zero or something. Yeah. Okay, but the patient is still talking to you, lucid. Yeah. Those, I, I would say in those instances, no, you don't need to because uh, the, and the reason why the patient is still able to talk to you because is because it's very chronic and the uh, brain matter has adapted to the ECF. Okay. That's why they're not in cerebral edema yet. I see. Uh, but in those patients, you wait long enough when you press the sodium down to less than 100, for sure they will go into uh, AMS one. Mm. So I think going back to the point, so long as the patient is talking to you and alert and very well, you have time. Okay. Then you I- investigate etiology carefully and um, treat the underlying problem carefully. And I would say those are the patients who you should definitely not try to give a saline drip. Okay. Uh, and, uh, but you should definitely do the investigation first because your saline drip will be the thing that tips them over. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much, Dr. Mok. I think today's session has been really very helpful. Uh, yeah, so once again, thanks so much.